welcome to another edition of Before Bedtime. On this program, we bring you nuggets you can ponder while you take a rest from the day's activity. It's a late, the late evening tea you need before you go to bed. We bring you everything from archaeology to zoology, if I may use that cliche. This evening, we are traveling to the United Kingdom and we are touching base with a senior youth advisor of Child Fund International USA, who is also a visiting fellow of Childhood and Youth Studies at the Open University UK. My guest is Dr. Michael Buampong. Good evening, welcome, and thanks for joining me. Happy New Year to you. Good evening, thank you very much, um, Jesse, and for the opportunity to be on this uh, program. Looking forward to sharing my experience. Uh, first of all, we want to uh, start from the very beginning. Uh, you grew up in Ghana. You were born in Ghana. I don't even know whether you are Ghanaian now. Maybe we'll find out in the course of the <laughs> of the conversation. But tell us, the family you were born into, how would you describe it? An average African family, an average Ghanaian family, one of privilege, or you want to describe it your own way? Um, so I was born in Accra, um, mm. that's where my mom and dad met, and, you know, I was born at Kolebu, okay. and then not long after, you know, I was born, I, we, uh, they moved to Kumasi. Okay. Um, so, and essentially, I think what I would say is um, I come from a middle class home. Okay. Uh, my dad um, was a banker, he used to work mm. with the Ghana Commercial Bank. Okay. And my mother was uh, um, an accountant at the Grace Development Board. Okay. Um, but you know, as you know, um, the cost of living in Ghana is you know always rising, so you can't always keep up to you know just the you know the, the usual career that you are doing to mm. make you know ends meet. So mm. I recall you know. Um, in my childhood days, my mom used to have a cold store. So, you know, she would buy fish and, you know, other meat products, you know, mm. put it in the freezer. And also she would, you know, usually wake up early before she would go to work to do mm. some pastries, um, put it by the, you know, the side of the entrance of our house. Yeah. And we had someone who was, you know, selling these products, but um, often maybe after I had closed from school, if I finished my extra classes at home, I would go and sit by, you know, maybe um, the pastries to help the person who was selling it mm -hmm. when maybe she had to do other things. So I think, um, I would say, yeah, I've been blessed, you know, to have good parents. Um, one thing that I really liked about my parents and, you know, which I still, you know, continue to admire them for was the fact that so long as you are asking something from them, which has to do with education, they would never say no. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they made sure they invested in uh the education of my brother and I uh, making sure that we had the extra classes to, you know, really help us with our education. Also, with other things, you know, as I, I, I was growing up, you know, even having to help me with my university education. I remember when I traveled to Sweden for my master's degree to, mm. they used to send me money from Ghana sometimes. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah, they've been there for me and I really mm. thank God for their lives to mm. have parents who are there mm. and, you know, present parents who are ready to support you to achieve your aspirations. Mm. You started getting stories published in some newspapers in Ghana at quite a, a young age. I'm not too sure at which level of education you were, you were, whether you were in the primary or junior high or whatever. I'm sure you will be able to put clarity to it. Those times, your, your issues had to do with youth. Some of them were short stories and other things. The motivation that got you started. What was the motivation? 
And at what level did you get published for the first time? Yes, so um, someone who, you know, I, I think, again, going back to my parents, um, mm. I remember, you know, growing up in Ghana, my dad always bought graphic, yeah, you know, daily, daily graphic, graphic every yes. day. And then on Wednesdays, that was when I was also looking up to maybe junior graphic or the children's world, mm -hmm. uh, which was published in um, Daily Graphic by then. Uh, but for me, um, the motivation behind writing um, was more or less for, you know, self-expression. Um, mm -hmm. I had completed, you know, BC by then. Okay. And I... You know, between the time when you were at home and also having to look up to, you know, going to senior high school, I, yeah. I, I took an interest in, you know, writing. But I believe that that also, you know, my creativity in writing and also the ability to express myself also so mm -hmm. shaped by, you know, the opportunity or the privilege I had to, you know, mm -hmm. read articles that had been written by people to know mm -hmm. how to write and all that from the junior graphic and also daily graphic by then. And so then I started writing, in, you know, um, the children's world corner of daily graphic. Okay. Um, I remember one of the um, stories I wrote um, that was about uh, why the cat likes to sit in the kitchen. <laughs> and then um, at some point too, I used to, <laughs> I used to write uh, for the mirror Okay. And also spectator, but yeah. those ones focused on you know um, morality. Um, I remember one article I wrote was about flee youthful lust. Okay. And also something that I believe was shaped by you know my godly upbringing and the need mm -hmm. to also encourage other young people to um, you know be mindful of you know things that would um, you know pervert them, and then also. Um, I wrote an article that focused on um, failure is never final. Also mm -hmm. to encourage, you know, other young people, because, you know, when you write BC or, you know, SSC, some people, you know, uh, obviously grades might not go as you want, but yeah. that was also an opportunity for me to encourage other young people. Um, when I, you know, growing up, you know, when I finished, senior high school going to university, I think I began to think more about, you know, development issues, had also issues concerning youth development. So I started to write more of, you know, okay. issues pertaining to advocacy, mm -hmm. you know, the the need for, you know, governments to include young people in decision making. Mm -hmm. And also around issues of youth unemployment and migration. Um, I think also one of the things that I find very important to write in is the fact that it's a, it's a very central part of, you know, my professional development okay. and how I, mm. you know, I, 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 I saw myself in the future. Mm. I wanted to be a thought leader. Okay. in migration issues and youth development mm -hmm. and by that you know i felt you know whatever idea that is on my mind i need to put it into writing i yeah. don't have to hide it um once you put it into writing and you have also a platform to express it 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 can really take you far get people to know you and also see you as a leader within a you know that particular field um before you continue you ask a question um... about Yes, I want to find, you know, getting published in a niche, in a national newspaper is a very competitive uh, thing to do. Mm. You you are up against even numbers you have no idea of. How many times did you write before you got your very first article published? I would say... Um... It was... Um, it was quite... Um... It wasn't that difficult for me okay. per se. And I think part of it also was also because um, I took my time to, you know, write, but also I had one of my teachers, 
okay. I remember his name now. I don't want to mention his name here, but he also took a very strong interest in, you know, my desire to write. Um, so sometimes when I write, he would, mm. you know, have a look at it and then, you know, help to edit it. And then um, what for him was important was for me to, you know, have the idea he was mm. going to help to, you know, edit it. And then um, I then had to, you know, make sure that I put it in an envelope and then mail it to um, the news uh, paper. Um, mm you know, outlet. So I think, um, yeah, for me, I wouldn't say I had um, a big challenge with, you know, when I, I wanted to write um, those first pieces, maybe where I, I would say I ha I've had some challenges or, you know, it hasn't been that straightforward as being, you know, getting into bigger institutions and meeting yeah. big thinkers who would want to, you know, um, give you more critique, push you more to, you know, uh, be much more deep in your thinking. Mm. Uh, you know, it's different from writing a story and yeah. then also now you are getting into um, academia where mm. you have a bunch of professors who are going yeah. to um, critique right. your work here. Mm. Yeah. Matters of youth development, mm. migration and social inclusion and the like are matters that have been close to your heart for a long time. At what point did you birth these as the path you wanted to craft or you wanted to take for a career? What brought about mm. these interests in the first place? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And for me, um, again, uh, one thing that I want to really thank God for is um, I was able to identify you know, a particular area or niche mm. area which I wanted to focus on at a very early age. So um, in, um, I think back in, um, in 2003, thereabouts, um, or maybe, yeah, 2003, um, I knew by then, you know, Kofi Annan had established um, the Global Commission for Migration, um, and okay. I did a chance on a report around that. Mm. But then before then also, I used to write for different, you know, platforms. Um, mm. there, there was, for instance, the UNICEF Voices of Youth. Okay. Uh, which was a platform for young people to express their ideas on different mm -hmm. development issues. And as I mentioned, I used to write for, you know, newspapers in Ghana, but I wanted to, you know, take it also to the global level. Okay. And, you know, I started writing on, you know, migration issues and other development issues that affect young people. And there was um, an opportunity for a young person to, um, speak at a UN event in New York okay. that was yeah. in 2006 mm. so I did put in my application and there was this youth organization in New York um, called Global Youth Action Network so they selected me to be a principal speaker at their first okay. high level dialogue on migration and development which was kind of convened by the United Nations but then also driven by the report that the Global Commission on Migration and Development produced. So I did participate in this meeting that was in 2006. And then um, from there, you know, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, mm. that was also when I had the opportunity to, you know, um, take a, a research topic. Okay. And I took this very seriously because I felt that was going to be the first time I would mm. ever do an independent, you know, um, research. Oh, yeah. So I decided to choose the topic of migration. Mm. And migration is such a broad area. You know, there is a human rights aspect. There is the, the economic aspect. But also one of the things that I had learned from the conference that I participated in and also the Global Commission on Migration Report was about the nexus between migration and development. Mm. 
um, which remittance is, you know, the money that migrants send back home yeah. plays a very crucial role. So one of the things that was fascinating to me was the fact that migrant remittances is, is mm -hmm. double, you know, official development assistance, which is wow. the money that developed countries give to um, developing countries for, you know, their development. And I yeah. felt like this is really interesting in, in what you you know, align it to the negative narratives that we see on um, the in the media mm. um, that migrants are drowning in the sea and all that, and you know, people should stay home. So, you know, I, I did travel to Brekum, mm. then you know, the Brahaf region, um, mm. to um, carry out you know first-hand interviews with returnees okay. and. I had a very fascinating interview. The results were quite very interesting that even for those who have been deported, often okay. they do come back with some money. They do come back with some skills and some of them had opened their own shops and they were not necessarily dependent on governments or other family relations to you know, have a form of livelihoods. Mm. So for me, this was quite, for me, you know, um, um the kind of first time experience I had interacting with returnees or migrants getting to know the tangible um impact of uh, migration. So at a point in time I started, you know, moving into advocacy that you know we need to talk more about the positive impacts of migration and also look at the human rights dimension. Um, I know ECOWAS, for instance, had this freedom of mobility without restriction, but these are all policies that mm. you wonder how are they implemented yeah. uh, within the sub-region. Um, so I decided to push migration through this youth organization that I established. Mm. We had a youth mm. migration program. Um, I used to do youth online consultations for major international events like the Global Forum on Migration and Development, which is still yeah. an ongoing one. Mm. Um, with time, I moved on to work with UNDP in Accra um, on a European Union um, sponsored project. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, another opportunity for me to develop my international experience. Um, and... Um, I remember when I was in New York, uh, you know, so after UNDP in Ghana, I moved to Sweden to do my master's. I went to okay. New York to work with mm. UNICEF um, as a migration specialist focused on young people. Then at some point, I had an opportunity to write the 2013 World Youth Report. Okay. Um, for the United Nations. And that to me stood out strongly because that report was also used as an advocacy piece within the member state debate during the second high level dialogue and migration in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Did you put that then, report together alone or you were with others? You did it with others? Yeah. So I led the development okay. of that report. Okay. Um, more or less, I did about 90% of the work. Okay. Um, okay. But I, one thing that I value in developing materials is to make sure young people play a key leadership role in the process. Mm. So I was able to identify other young people who were, okay. you know, um, leading some of the themes around, mm. you know, maybe diaspora engagement. Mm. Um, how do we prepare young people to move? And I was also able to get some collaborative report, uh, support from institutions like the ILO. Okay. Um, and, you know, um, after that report, um, I think I also had the privilege of, of sitting on a steering committee okay. of the Secretary General to develop um, the SG report on migration and development. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2014. So I would say it's, it's been something that started early mm. and um, sustaining it over time through advocacy, writing, 
mm. um, putting out, you know, my thoughts and also getting the perspectives on the young people of young mm. people to write maybe policy briefs or reports that mm. helps decision makers at various level, whether at the UN or other levels of decision making to understand what mm. is the thinking of young people and how do we understand them better to implement mm. policies that okay. align with yeah, their thinking or their needs. Okay. Africa is uh, generally a very young population. It is more youthful probably mm. than Europe. Um, but you are somebody who has a passion for youth development and the representation of the youth at uh, very important sections where they can speak up and be heard. Are you satisfied with the representation of the youth? Let's come to Africa. Are you satisfied with the representation of the youth from politics to the corporate world to business and everything in between? Take a Kesri walk through Africa and give me what your impressions are. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think you're right that, you know, Africa has the youngest population. Mm. Um, on the average, you have majority of Africans' population um, being below the age of 30. Mm. Um, but then when you look at statistics, you realize that um, there is still that kind of generational gap uh, mm. where you find leaders who are leading a very young population, uh, you know, above. I think the average years. age that was noted in the report by the Afrobarometer okay. was, I think, 65. Uh, wow. If I am, yeah, maybe I'm more generous. <laughs> but you would still have leaders who are 80 years, but yeah. the average is like, you know, 60, right? Mm. Uh, so if you are looking at 30 against 60, it's like a huge generational no. gap. Mm. And I think that is something that we need to take seriously in terms of governance um, mm. and how leaders reflect the needs of their population. But one of the things or the observation that I've made is also be, you know, the fact that there are a lot of barriers that you know young people face mm. uh, when they want to you know and you know go you know when they want to venture into politics or mm. you know there are some barriers to political participation for young people mm. um, for instance if you are looking at um the cost of you know um elections and you know mm. how much it would cost you know file your nomination mm. um also if you are looking at this in relation to you know the rising cost of unemployment you know how does an unemployed person uh, vie for a political position when there is a high cost of yeah. you know political participation and also i think there are also some age restrictions when you look at some of the policies that we have. Yeah. Um, you know, if we have a very young population, what is the minimum age that a young person is able to buy? And in I, Ghana, I you have to be 45 Nigeria, minimum to be able to buy for president. Yes, exactly. So that's a major, you know, barrier if mm -hmm. you are looking at because the, the 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 starting age of a young a youth by definition is from um fifteen. Yeah. Right. So on the average, maybe if we we are looking at um promoting youth participation in politics mm -hmm. and leadership, then we should be able to lower this um age so that you know, young persons, even as young as maybe 19, can, you know, vie for a political position if, they, if mm -hmm. only they have the capacity to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these barriers need to be addressed. Otherwise, it's going to be challenging, um, mm -hmm. you know. And if, you know, we can also look at mainstreaming youth, 
um, okay. into development processes and you know um for instance it's not we can't all be you know uh, ministers or you know uh, prime minister or whatever name is being given mm. to a leader in any country or maybe but then if for instance the ministry of this or that they they can promote you to leadership in maybe their board or management mm -hmm. um, it's one way of promoting you know um, youth leadership mm -hmm. and that's what you know I used to um, work a lot on when I was doing this um, recent report on um, youth development in Ghana um, one of the ad, uh, recommendations I put across was the need for us to you know mainstream youth into development Mm -hmm. um, so that it's not just about the politics, but then how do we see youth as central to development? Mm -hmm. So that, for instance, every ministry or department in an African country has a youth leader amongst yeah. their board members, and they take on their views and opinions to mm -hmm. promote inclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were part of a team of researchers that looked into the impact of COVID-19 on mm -hmm. Black Blacks in the UK, let's say in Britain, yes. let me narrow it down. Uh, what were some of the challenges or some of the uh, 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 things you found out during this study? But I was actually trying to look out for the recommendations and conclusions of the study. I don't know if it's done, if it's out, because what I saw was like when the study was in progress, some sort of interim report updating on the progress of the study what was the outcome what were some of the findings hmm. so that 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 was a very interesting study obviously covid was a difficult time for many hmm. people um but um uh, it was more challenging for immigrants um i think one of the laws in the uk um, is there no recourse to public funds for mm. most immigrants? So wow. by this, um, during COVID, when people mm. are being laid off <laughs> and you have to stay at home, uh, maybe the citizens or the indigenous will have government support or benefit. Mm. But when you have no recourse to public funds, that means that you don't get any form of support if you are one of the people who have been laid off. Mm. Um, yes, so that that's that's a major challenge because then it comes to basic needs like, you know, how are parents able to provide food for their children mm. um, and all that. So that was one of the observations that we made that immigrants in particular, you know, have this... Um, double effect you know based on their race also if maybe they are doing many jobs which yeah. they are you know doesn't often have the benefits of social security then mm -hmm. you 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 are going to be hard uh, they were hard hit you know mm -hmm. if i should put it that way yeah. um at the same time also because i focused on young people and also immigrant families then that also meant that if a parent uh, some parents who have lost their jobs couldn't send money, you know, obviously to Ghana, yeah. uh, where maybe their parents are, uh, sorry, their children are. So there was that kind of, you know, uh, um, not just a UK effect, but then also yeah. a transnational effect of people That's losing right. their jobs, not being able to send money back home. And I think that was one of the things that we were trying to put across in that piece of research that mm. we don't just think about, you know, COVID and its impact on um, people as mm. um, a one state issue. Mm. Um, the fact that it was a trans, you know, national disease um, mm. then also meant that the economic effects uh, for migrants and their relation back in Ghana was something that needed to be taken into consideration. Mm. 
what stands out for you as uh, that single individual achievement in the line of uh, in your professional life, which for you is dearest to your heart? Hmm. So I think uh, my achievement, which I'm very proud of, is um, I would say two, mm. <laughs> mainly uh, the 2013 World Youth Report, okay. uh, which I wrote for the United Nations. Mm. Um, and this was the World Youth Report. So okay. it had a, a global engagement and a mm. global ramification. Um, it was used as an advocacy piece amongst UN member states. Um, one thing that I'm proud of is um, today, I have seen that young people are taking more seriously mm. in UN member states, uh, debate on migration. So back in 2013, mm. um, youth then was not a major um, constituency that was recognized, not to yeah. talk of 20, uh, 2006 <laughs> when, you know, I made reference to that conference. So yeah. now, because of that report, you, we see a lot of um, recognition of youth as a very important constituent in migration issues. And I must say that this is also uh, at the backdrop of the fact that when you look at global migration mm. trends, young people form almost nearly half of international migrants. Yeah. But then they have not been, you know, taken seriously in terms mm. of decision making. Yeah. Um, the second thing is this um, um, youth development reports that I was commissioned by the Commonwealth Secretary to work okay. on mm -hmm. um, for the government of Ghana. And as we all know, when you are developing a policy, you need to have evidence. So yes. that report served mm. as a basis for the development of Ghana's current national aid policy, mm. uh, which I'm very proud of. And um, as you and I always talk about, <laughs> um, it's not just about the policy. You need to think that's about right. the implementation. And that's, that's something right. that I'm looking forward to. Right. Um, yeah. Now, a number of factors keep affecting migration across the globe. Currently, as we speak, we have troubles in Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, or depending on how you are looking at it, Israel and Hamas. It looks like everybody has their own definition of what is going on. Even these two, and of course, there are also oppressed minorities and people who are have become targets of their government's fleeing into exile, among other things. I know the, the ideal picture of migration advocates like yourself is a world where migration is completely legal so that people can have that kind of uh, dignity of humanity preserved wherever they find themselves. But with all these challenges all over the world, it's a world where migration is really legal only a realistic targets. Yeah. I like the contest that you've <laughs> placed this question. <laughs> and I think that will make my work easy. Yes. Um, so I think it's possible, but mm. it's going to take time. Okay. Um, first of all, there needs to be that political will. Okay. You know? Migration is something that has become very politicized and used by politicians from different standpoints to, mm. you know, um, get votes from people. And somehow to, we also need to recognize that um, there are different kinds of migration. You know, there is mm. voluntary migration, there is a forced migration. Yeah. Um, we've seen stable countries where people are prospering that, you know, have been plunged into war and insecurity. When you look at a place like Libya, I remember yes. when I used to do, when I was doing my field work um, there, mm. um, I knew Ghanaians who used to travel to Libya, um, though they had 
you know, aspirations of moving to Europe, they would still, some, some of them came back to Ghana with a lot of, you know, skills or maybe money to start a business and keep their family. So it is making, the, the fact that Libya is unstable now is making migrants and, you know, and also most developing countries are economically unstable uh, with economic challenges. So we are having a lot of people who are moving out of desperation, right? So unless we address, you know, some of the driving factors of migration, uh, it becomes more difficult to talk about legal paths. So, and at the same time also, the legal paths for migration, yeah. uh, uh, you know, are shrinking, mm. you know, also because we have political figures who are there now who... Yeah are very resistant to the movement of people. Mm. And also because it's being politicized and also I believe that there, sometimes the media also creates a very negative narrative about migration. So it makes people who listen to the news sometimes think like, oh, there are a lot of people coming into our country to steal jobs. <laughs> so let's vote. Let's vote to stop these immigrants. So, yeah. you know, if we can change things about political will and also put more positive narratives about mm -hmm. migration, people can be receptive to migration. And I think this also connects with an issue about evidence-driven policies or discourse, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at the demographic profile of Africa, yeah. Africa has a very young population, yet mm -hmm. governments are unable to create jobs mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the you know the, the youth population. At the same time, when you look at Europe, Europe's age, you know, um, demographic is aging. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that there is a need or there is going to be a growing in demand and I think that's what we see today like the UK government is that's right. you know recruiting a lot of healthcare workers yes and um, to come over so that's one way of you know legal migration but one of the things that I always talk about and what I advocate for is making sure that we are inclusive in how we talk about migration mm. if the cost of recruiting a health worker from Africa it's up to the tune of maybe 4,000 pounds. Mm. How many people in a rural place in Africa would have that money? Um, so at the end of the day, people resort to, you know, illegal parts. Yeah. And so we need to fix a lot of underlying factors and also okay. fix, you know, basic things, um, for instance, around education. Mm. Um, I like to say that um, education is a leveler, you know, because mm. I, for one, I never knew anyone in the United Nations. Okay. Um, my parents were local, you know, bankers. My mom, a local yeah. accountant in Ghana. But yeah. education, if is really um, invested in mm. uh, by, you know, leaders and also young people take advantage of their quality mm. education. You can easily, you know, get a scholarship. You can yeah. get, you know, um, other opportunities um, to live in any part of the world that you want to. Mm. And you can go in and out easily. Yes. Yeah. So I I believe that, you know, we can get there. It will take time. But let's fix some of these underlying issues of education, um, you know, economic development, mm. promoting peace, like you mentioned, all these mm. unstable countries, how do we promote peace to make sure that people move um, mm. in a safe, legal and orderly manner? Uh, between leadership, bad leadership and terrorism, which of them is the biggest threat or which of them is the biggest contributor to illegal migration? I think uh, that's a very good question. I don't have a straightforward answer, but <laughs> okay. I think both of them are terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you can have bad leadership and mm. it's going to, you know, 
um, force people to move mm. out of your country. Yeah. And terror, uh, you know, also doesn't encourage people to stay where they are. Yeah. Because everybody wants to have peace. Sure. And, you know, migration is something natural yeah. for every human population, mm. you know. Uh, people want safety, they want development. Um, so when you are ruling a country and, you know, there is bad economics and the country is collapsing, obviously yeah. young people who want to um, achieve certain aspirations in life, yeah. like buy a home, get mm -hmm. a job, they might be forced to look for opportunities elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, similar to if you are living in a country where there is insecurity yeah. or terror, you can't mm -hmm. prosper and it will force people to move. So they all run hand in hand and That's right. really make <laughs> any environment safe for anyone to live in. That's right. Yeah. Um, you have done quite an impressive work professionally for these almost 20 years. What will be the height for you in your career before you say, okay, it's time for me to go have some rests? away from career, traveling, whatever, migration, youth development issues. What is the height you want to hit before you go take a rest? Yes. I think this is a very good question uh, for anyone who wants to know how what I'm thinking about for the future. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've done work for governments and also other institutions. Mm. I, uh, for me... I think I am someone who aspires to make influence okay. um, and impact. Mm. And I believe um, getting into, you know, executive position or senior leadership within an international organization is something that would help me okay. um, to um, contribute to, you know, decision making. Uh, also based on, you know, the values that I believe in. Um, obviously, I want to promote youth participation. Mm -hmm. I want to see um, development trickle down to the needs of uh, marginalized populations. And sometimes you don't get to achieve these, right, yeah. when you are not in an executive position or right. senior management. So obviously, you know, to climb up and get to maybe um senior leadership within um, like you and secretary general uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> maybe that's prophetic <laughs> yes but that's been one of my you know when i was uh, growing up that was a big you know kofi annan was a very mm uh important figure for me yeah um and you know the fact that he was Ghanaian and mm. was also making a lot of impact in international development was a motivation and encouragement to me and if god would bring me to that um opportunity you know why not <laughs> <laughs> yes but what defines what defines fulfillment for you in life and in your career Mm. I think uh, for me, fulfillment uh, has a lot of facets for me. I am someone who values relationships. Mm. Um, so um, I, I like to, you know, be with family, um, be with cherished friends mm. who would encourage and motivate me. Um, also, I do value um personal growth and you know um professional growth so you know i wanted to do a phd and thankfully you know and by god's grace and also with the support of you know people around me including, mm. including my supervisor i was able to get my doctorate which uh was something that i wanted to achieve in life and i yeah. feel fulfilled with that and mm -hmm. um, there is also that element of making impact. You know, you can aim for money, you can aim for this. But for me, when I see a young person 
um, who has a job, who is flourishing with maybe an entrepreneurial venture. It's something that I'm proud of, especially through the programs that I have been part of within mm. the organizations that I've worked with. Mm. And um, lastly, also to make mention of the importance of spiritual growth and development. Yeah. Um, my wife and I, we always talk about the fact that any Sunday that we go to church is like um, something that refreshes us, right? Yeah. We find it very refreshing um, mm. after the busy times that we have with work yeah. and makes us, you know, really fulfilled um, that we are not just looking at the economic or the fiscal aspect of life, but, you know, ultimately the spiritual aspect and I have been privileged to also serve as the young adult leader within my church. I also sing in the choir and wow. whenever I sing to you, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it brings joy to my heart. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So the, these are, you know, the main things that, you know, constitute fulfillment in life for me. Mm. Is there any decision that if you had the opportunity, you would have taken it much earlier in life? Um, yes, that's a very good question and something that I often reflect on and also encourage young people mm. with. Uh, I think earlier on, um, I would have wished, you know, have a mentor. Okay. Um, Particularly, you know, the field of international development, mm. as I said, my parents were not in that area yeah. of work. Yeah. Um, and also, because I, I had an international um, goal, um, I wish I had had a mentor who would guide me on, do this, mm. do that, do that, and you'll get here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something that, you know, I hope, you know, listeners will take into mm. consideration mm. Mm. get someone who would mentor you um and you know obviously these mentors they would have walked the path that you want to walk in they might even be in the destination that you are looking to get to and they can help you navigate and avoid certain things and have a smooth ride, if I should put it that way. If we are to roll back the hands of time, 20 years, are you going to take the same professional path or you do something different? I will. I will take that same path. I think for me, I see youth development as a calling for me. Mm. I've always loved to, you know, um, make an impact in the lives of young people and mm. that's the reason why i established young people we care in ghana and you know after many years i still i'm still in that sector okay um i became an assistant professor even then i was still doing research on youth <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's still giving me a mix of you know experiences mm. things that I believe it's all kind of shaping it into what is the calling and the purpose that I have in life. Maybe this is going to be my uh, last question. Mm. For all these uh, years and works you have done, obviously there have been a number of people who are also looking up to you in your field of work. What has been the relationship between you and much younger people that you know of who have shown interest in your work? Are you still in touch with them? Is there some sort of mentorship you are giving them? Or you have just given them a compass to navigate in their own unmarked waters, just as you did? Yeah, great. So... In terms of relationship, um, mm. I would say it is at different levels. Um, okay. First of all, I started youth 
youth development by establishing a youth organization that yeah. had young people and some people don't know you were part of that organization I was a part, yes. <laughs> at some point <laughs> yes <laughs> so um you know now we are here we are talking of still about you know things that relate to young people uh, mm. i know when you approached me for this session or interview i, yeah. I couldn't say no uh, <laughs> obviously because of the relationship we have that's right um at the same time, also, I know there are new emerging leaders who are coming mm. up. Mm. Um, one avenue I have is um, I still provide some advice to young people, you know, from time to time when maybe okay. a parent will say, oh, speak to my daughter. I, I know yesterday, mm. for instance, um one person in Ghana who used to be mm. even a minister, I wouldn't mention okay. the name. She she mm. called me and asked me, you know, my daughter wants to do a PhD. How can I, wow. um, you know, uh, be of help? So mm. from time to time, you know, when I have these requests from here and there, yeah, I make sure that I make time, you know, mm. as you asked me earlier. I could be busy, but yeah, I want to see uh, my life uh, being impactful for other young mm. people. So um, I'm always available to take a call. Uh, I get emails, mm. get, you know, messages on WhatsApp mm. and trying to help young people. Um, also, sometimes I direct them to resources, right? Yeah. If I can't have all the time, but I mm. can say, oh, go to this. Mm. You get what you need. That's it's, right. it's enough. And yeah, and I also do contribute to projects here and there, which I believe is all making impacts, even in the lives of those whom I haven't mm. met. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. In person. Yeah. I said it was my last question, but something just came up. It just obliged <laughs> me this last one. You, for all these you have done, these years you keep talking about your relationship with god your church activities and all how central is your spirituality or your relationship with god in all these that you do mm -hmm. that's a good question um i think you know my relationship with god is very central mm um to my life and whatever i've achieved um first of all knowing that even the ideas that i've had in life uh and in my career and also even the fact that you know i should get to this fundamental thing about you know even knowing christ you know yeah. and being born again mm -hmm. um, is not something that is open to many people um, okay. and even coming from a godly home. Mm -hmm. So those things were very important in helping me to know the principles mm -hmm. that God has laid for us in life. That if you don't go this path, you would not, you know, make it to yeah. your destination as the bible tells us you know and i always tell people that um of course you can prosper without being a christian you see people who are not necessarily having a good relationship with god but they are still moving on mm. but you know there is this passage in the bible that says that there is a way that seemeth right <laughs> unto okay. a man but the end thereof is destruction yeah. you have people who are flourishing you know today but sometimes you read the end story or you know the 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 the, the ending part of their life and sometimes it's not yeah. um, a happy ending yeah um so for me having the Bible guide me mm. in this journey of life is very important. And I take my Bible reading very serious. And by that also applying the word of God to my life. Mm. And, and 
as the Bible says, we don't need to be just hearers, but then also we need to be doers. And being doers also mean applying the word of God and bearing fruits. Yeah. And that fruit being something that impacts, you know, the life of the people around you. Yeah, yeah which um, I believe that if I hadn't known the 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 mystery or the secrets that yeah. is being revealed to me through scripture, maybe yeah. it would have been another thing. Uh, yeah. So I really thank God, and I continue to um do things that I believe God is continually, you know, using me to impact yeah. on um people around me and you know the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. This conversation can go on and on and on, but it's bedtime. Yes. We have to go. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Michael Buampo, for your time and for taking us through your career, your profession, and also your life, uh, and telling us, uh, letting us into some of the contributions you have made towards youth development globally. We are truly grateful. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. And, right. Yeah. This has been before bedtime. I know it is bedtime. Uh, he shared a lot. Uh, this is somebody I can say. I don't have, I cannot be exact, but I can say he's less than 45 years. But through this period, he's been able to contribute immensely to the global conversation around youth development, migration, and social inclusion. Uh, he's one of the people that I have known for how many years? 30 years or Since more, childhood, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have stayed in touch all these years. And through the period, we've shared resources, sometimes opportunities, among others. And today we decided to focus on him. He didn't see it coming, but I just decided to pull him onto the screens for us to hear the story that no matter where you come from, it is possible. From Kumasi in Ghana, West Africa, uh, he's been able to rise up to a certain point. Where, whatever it is your story, I believe that with tenacity of purpose, and as he said, most importantly, the fear of God, it is possible and it is too well. Thanks for joining us. We are back again next week with another edition. Uh, we'll still be talking about a very important topic and we'll have somebody with the right expertise in that area join us so that before bedtime, we can have something to ponder over. Bye for now.